Welcome to the forum at All Saints Church. My name is Mike Kinman. My pronouns are he, him. I'm the, the rector, the senior pastor here at All Saints. Everyone turn around and wave at the camera. Say hi to everyone watching us uh, online. Uh, great, to have you, uh, great to have you all here. Um, just want to, before we start, and I'll probably do this again at the end, I'm holding up a ballot. Um, I hope everyone who is in here and who is watching online, uh, at least in the state of California, where our primary election, we have an election on Tuesday, has filled out their ballot and has either mailed it or will mail it or will put it in the box. I'm going to walk across the street after church this morning and put this in the box. Voting is a sacred duty, um, and the conversation that we are going to have this morning will show us, it will really be a, a part of how important it is that we participate uh, in this political process. And so uh, I'm deeply grateful to uh, have as our guest uh, Temadayo Aganga Williams, who is, uh, I want to just uh, thank Adichie Byerly here. Uh, Adichie, this is the, the, great, the great nephew, the grand nephew? The great nephew is, uh, he is the great nephew of uh, Adichie Byerly. And Adichie, thank you so much for making uh, this, um, this connection so we can do this. Um, Tem is an experienced litigator bringing strong government credentials to his representation of clients facing complex government enforcement actions, internal investigations, congressional oversight, and high stakes legal civil litigation. Most recently, he served as senior investigative counsel for the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Before that, he was an assistant U.S. attorney in the criminal division of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York. As senior investigative counsel, he was responsible for investigating the facts, circumstances, and causes of the attack and issues relating to the peaceful transfer of power. In that role, he conducted depositions and interviews of dozens of witnesses, including senior advisors to former President Trump, provided legal and strategic guidance on novel congressional investigation issues, coordinated the presentation of evidence for nationally televised hearing, and contributed to the select committee's final report. Wow, that's a lot. And so first of all, welcome. Welcome to All Saints Church. Great to have you here virtually. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. So, so you were working for the U.S. Attorney in the Criminal Division of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern uh, District of New York. Did you get a phone call? Did this come out of the blue? How did you become part of this committee? And what were your first thoughts when someone asked you to consider this? So, yeah, the committee was passed by, you know, originally there was going to be a joint commission, which would have meant that the Senate and the House would have come together to investigate what happened on the 6th, the way we did with 9-11. That failed in the Senate, and then uh, former Speaker Pelosi took it up in the House and passed that resolution in, in July of 2021. <laughs> And I first got the phone call by a former supervisor who used to be in the U.S. Attorney's Office, which for those may not know, meaning we were federal prosecutors. And she left and was working in the Senate for Homeland Security Committee at the time of the attack. So she had begun part of the investigation from the Senate side. When she moved over to the House side to help conduct that investigation, the team was built out with an idea of looking at a lot of former federal prosecutors or current because as federal prosecutors, you conduct large scale, uh, large scale, quick uh, investigations that really have to handle a large amount of information, a large amount of witnesses and typically complex uh, legal concepts. So she sent me a text on a Wednesday, I remember, and asked me, hey, you know, we're staffing this committee. Would you have any interest? And of course, I was like, you know, are you joking? Yes, I'm interested. <laughs> Um, and on Thursday, I spoke to my future boss, just an informal conversation. A few days later on that Monday, I had a full interview and I got the job. And that afternoon, I told the Department of Justice that I was uh, leaving to go to D.C. because I actually had to resign right. from the DOJ to go work for Congress and uh, be a lawyer there. Right, because like, you can't work for two branches of government at the same time, right? So... Well, you actually can. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, there are things, uh, we call them details, where you work for uh, one either agency and it happened within one branch, but you can be detailed to a second branch. So in the abstract, it's possible 
that prosecutors could have been detailed, which would have been not supervised by the DOJ, but basically lent over to Congress. Uh, there was a decision made at the highest levels, uh, you know, way, way, way above my pay grade, that no one would be detailed, which, in retrospect, was a great decision because, as we all know, criminal uh, there were recommendations for criminal charges, and you know, there, we didn't want the appearance that the DOJ sent over prosecutors who still worked or were paid by the DOJ to then recommend charges to be sent back to the DOJ. Right. So one of one of the strategies that Donald Trump has used throughout his life when he is charged with something is to attack the litigators, attack the prosecutors, attack uh, whoever is charging him. Did you have any, did, did it give you pause at all that you might be making yourself a target of this person who has the sort of incredible you know, resources to target people at his disposal? Uh, we, we certainly thought about it. I mean, I, I think I, I would answer that in two ways. For myself, I don't really didn't have a lot of concern. I think part of that is because of the work I was doing as a former prosecutor in that you're dealing, you know, I did a lot of cartel prosecutions and you're, you know, you are concerned you're dealing gang prosecutions. So you, 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 you already are uh, predisposed to thinking about a level of danger or exposure in your work. I think what concerned me was thinking more so about my family. You know, it's one right. thing to sign up for a job yourself and assume a risk. It's another thing that if you were somehow became a target, then those around you could get basically, you know, some collateral fallout from that. And that was my concern. Uh, but, you know, as I led up and joined the job, you did what you can as far as lowering your Internet footprint, as far as connecting yourself to your family members online and whatnot. Uh, but besides that, it was such a historic opportunity, I couldn't turn it down. That's good. Well, can you just sort of walk us through both the scope of the work that you were given and the actual work of the committee? Yeah. So what might be helpful is to talk about what a normal committee looks like. So you have what are, are called standing committees, which means those are just permanent committees that either are in the House or the Senate. And they have an area of work that they legislate in and they conduct investigations in order to determine whether to pass a bill. We were a select committee, which there are other kinds of select committees, but those are temporary committees that are established to investigate a specific thing. And then they will disband, which is the which is the idea. What made our committee different is that, frankly, it was run a lot more like a U.S. attorney's office. It was run like a DOJ prosecutor style investigation. So of the 20 something lawyers that were on the committee, I think 15 of us uh, were former prosecutors. So that was really, it was run in a, in a different way. And it was conducted what we would call like a bottom up investigation. So in Congress, when you're investigating something, you want to know more about what Facebook has been doing on something. You call Mark Zuckerberg, you call the CFO and they testify to Congress. That's not how the DOJ would do an investigation of a gang or a criminal enterprise. You start at the bottom, you talk to the guys at the bottom and you work way up and you build your story and your narrative of the facts. And at the end, you're looking at the guy at the top, for our purposes, Donald Trump. So we conducted an investigation in that way. And what that looks like, I would explain is kind of in three parts. First, there's the fact gathering. And what that looks like is issuing a lot of subpoenas conducting informal interviews, conducting depositions, which are, you know, as you expect, the more formal transcribed process. And that's just trying to learn what happened. I mean, for us, one of the ways we did that initially was, frankly, reading articles. Because by the time we got up and going, the media had been reporting and investigating what happened from the day it happened. So they really had a leg up on us. So we just had to take in a large amount of information very quickly then turn around and go get more information. So you have that fact gathering process that went on a long time. And then eventually it was about preparing and telling the American people the story during our hearings. And that happened over the summer of 2022. We did, I believe, nine hearings and it took all that information and how do you tell a cohesive, compelling story that people will watch on primetime television and then the last step of the work was the report, which is taking all that we've learned and done and putting that in a historical record that people can read and digest for years to come.
So let me just jump into a, a part of that, which is you really just named that this was not just a congressional hearing. This was a global media event. Yeah. And, and as you were preparing to present your report to the select committee, how much of that went into your thoughts around your preparation of that you really have this dual role? Or did you see it as a dual role? Did you see, no, this is just for the committee? Or how much of it was, we need to present something compelling to a global media audience? Uh, you know, how, in other words, how important was the court of the public opinion compared to the court of the select committee? Yeah, so, you know, you conduct the investigation always focused on where the, you know, where the facts and evidence lead you. But the same way in a criminal prosecution is the same thought we had of you still have to be able to tell a story. When you conduct the criminal investigation, that may at times end up with a trial. And instead of the American public, you have a jury and you have to think about, OK, how do I take all that I've done and I believe to be true and convince the jury beyond a reasonable doubt that this crime occurred and this person should be convicted? So similarly, we had the conversations and the discussions from the beginning of this story has to be told. It's not just about finding out what happened, but people have to hear it and be able to digest it and understand it. And there's also the historical concerns of how does the story get told for American people in the future? Um, and one of the critical things that we did that was different is we really relied heavily on video recorded depositions. Typically in a congressional investigation before us, you would have what's basically like a court reporter. Someone's typing down what's or what's being said, and that becomes the only record of, of what was said in that interview. We had cameras and recorded all of our depositions, which really was a game changer, because it allowed us to have a visual medium to tell that story uh, to the American public in the hearings. Also importantly, what we did is actually brought on the former head of ABC as, you know, as someone who has deep experience in telling stories in compelling ways. Lawyers can tell stories to a jury, yes, but it's still, that's, that's something different yep. than telling stories to an entire nation, an entire world. So we had a TV, basically TV professionals come in and help us take all that work and tell it in a coherent but entertaining way, you know, because they have the experience yep. of yep. knowing yep. what kind of clips are going to make people interested, what kind of clips could go viral what kind of clips are going to be compelling emotionally. So they were really partners in making the hearings so we could have those hearings that people really were drawn to. So, well, and first of all, let me say, good job. I mean, what you presented was really fantastic and powerful. Um, and I don't know if you can hear the applause in here, so I'm not alone in this opinion. Um, sort of a couple things. So like, you know, I, like many of us, were riveted to that testimony uh, and to the report. One of the frustrating things for me, and I want you to kind of fact check me on this, is that two th it, it appeared that A, you could subpoena someone and they could just say, no, I'm not gonna testify. Um, and it also seemed that people could pretty much say whatever they want, even lie, without really discernible consequence. Um, am, I yeah. I mean, am I right about that or am I, am I wrong about that? And first, so if I'm right, why is that and, and how do you deal with that? So I think what's really important to understand is how criminal investigations work versus congressional investigations. So when I was a criminal prosecutor, you your ability and power to compel is far stronger, right? If if the DOJ, uh, the way we would build a case, for example, you would come in, we would interview, but typically when someone's coming in, we may already have uh, evidence that they've committed a crime. We can charge them. And going to prison is quite the negotiating uh, a tool. So when someone lies to you, first off, lying to a federal official in and of itself, not under oath, not anything else, that is a felony. So if you, if you come in and you were speaking to me and an FBI agent and you lied, you already committed a crime, no matter whether I had evidence about the thing I was actually investigating you for. But if you're having material lies to us about what we ask you, that's already a, a, a crime. So that's one thing. Two... It, it, if someone doesn't compel you, if someone doesn't uh, follow a subpoena, it's a lot easier for me as a criminal prosecutor to go to a judge and frankly have the marshals come and take you into custody and physically bring you to come testify. So all these various tools you have as a prosecutor, you don't have that as a congressional investigator because when you do congressional investigations, the purpose of that is legislative. 
So all this investigation is not to prosecute Trump or anyone else. It's it, we can't arrest people in the same way. This is Congress. So what Congress is built for, the tools it has are not really in the same way. Uh, we don't have the same ability to compel. So when someone, for example, come, come, didn't want to come in, the one thing we could do, there were two options, basically. One had not been done, I think, since like 1800 and something, which is Congress inherent power to find someone in contempt, which means Congress would arrest you and put you in a congressional cell. That had not been done in like 150 years. Wow. And frankly, I, I, I don't know whether the American public still would have accepted us kind of taking that role if 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 they saw Nancy Pelosi has arrested Mark Meadows and he's sitting now in the Rayburn building in D.C. until he answers questions. I don't that, I don't think the American people were kind of built for that. So the second thing we can do is that if you can't if you are in contempt of Congress is that you can refer that to the Department of Justice for prosecution, because right, right, all prosecution is happening from the executive branch. So, but the way it works practically, it has to be pretty egregious for it to be contempt, right? Mm -hmm. As the word sound, it's contempt. Right. So it's not, oh, I was 10 minutes late, or I didn't show, no, it's like, right. you have to be really thumbing your nose at the process. So, but there were people, right, who have been convicted, right? People, you have Steve Bannon, uh, you have Peter Navarro, you know, folks who we did refer to Department of Justice, and they were convicted and found in contempt. And Peter Navarro, for example, who was a key Trump advisor uh, and, and spread a lot of these election lies, he has a prison sentence for not, uh, for not complying. And lastly, most people did comply. I mean, you had the big names of like a Mark Meadows, but one thing Mark Meadows had for him is that he actually gave us a lot of critical information. So yes, he didn't show up for a deposition, but he turned over his text messages, which showed extensive amount of information about what, for example, the former president was doing while the attack was going on. It showed all the right wing pundits like Laura Ingram, who were telling, who were saying the only person who can stop the attack is the president. It showed Clara Thomas's wife, Ginny Thomas, reaching out and talk to Mark Meadows and trying to help her return the election. So it's harder to say, was that individual in contempt of Congress when they provided a lot of information and we're trying to negotiate and but they didn't show up for a deposition it's tougher but no question the power to compel as a criminal prosecutor it's unmatched and that's what shows you the difference between you know we'll talk about jack smith's investigation i'm sure right. but there's a lot of tools that he's using and able to use that we couldn't use right. but we were successful because i will tell you this on average people came in and to your last point about whether people lie People did lie. Lots of, yeah. in my view, lots of big name people lied. I mean, you had Jared Kushner, who could not remember a single thing about <laughs> anything of importance, right? right. <laughs> the same way you had um, um, uh, Ivanka Trump, who the same way she when she was on stand in the civil case in New York about the Trump organization, can't, can't recall a lot of things. She talked to us. She couldn't recall a lot of things. But they came in and they testified. And in a criminal case, if you lied, I would, it's that same point I first made. Right. Lying in and of itself is a federal offense. And the last thing I'll say on this is that we also had time pressure. Mm -hmm. So we were moving a thousand different ways all at the same time. And with the criminal investigation, when you're only worried about a statute of limitations, you can take your time to prosecute someone and force them and do this. With mm -hmm. us, unless the information was really critical, you had to keep moving because we had to get the report done. What, so Thank you. And so let's let's sort of skip to the end of the process. The the committee concluded basically four things, as I understand it, that um, they recommended that the DOJ charge Trump with obstruction of an official proceeding, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to knowingly make a false statement, and assisting, aiding, or confronting, comforting an insurrection. And that last one is important because that activates Section Three, Article Fourteen. Or, or Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which yeah. would bar him from running for president, which is part of what's in front of the Supreme Court right now. So yeah. first of all, sort of a couple things on this. The first is, um, as you go through this and you're investigating, you are, of course, developing your own opinions. Yeah. Um, and how do you feel about the charges that the DOJ has brought? Are they what you hope? Do you wish they, you know, they go too far, not far enough? 
How are you feeling about what has happened since the select committee hearing? So we always, uh, well, I, should, I should say for myself, but I think most of my colleagues w would agree. Our work was always going to be just step one. We were, you know, I've had I've had some folks tell me, you know, why didn't you guys arrest him? Or why didn't you guys? I'm like, well, that's not, we were Congress. We can't arrest the right. former president. We can't prosecute the former president. It's just not our role. So we were always step one. And if we found evidence of crimes, step two would be what we're watching now. That is what Jack Smith is doing. I am very happy with the charges he brought. I mean, there's two ways he could have gone. He could have gone with a very expansive indictment, something kind of like what you saw in Georgia with Fonnie Willis, where you were really telling the story of a wide ranging conspiracy and you're charging a lot of people. He went down with a slim ind indictment, only charging the former president. And I think frankly, with the idea that it's a simpler case to tell you have so much more culpability when you are the actual president doing the, this offenses and you would be with all his accomplices. And he did not charge what people call basically seditious conspiracy. And that's one of the charges we suggested, but he didn't charge it. And I think there is a strong uh, logic behind what he did, why he didn't charge it. I think it makes his case more complicated. The litigation around that would be even more extensive than we see now. And I know there's a lot of focus on how that would have barred um, former President Trump from running again. But frankly, that argument about barring him has been elevated kind of later in the process. But I think, folks, nothing here is going to be the silver bullet, I think, to stop Donald Trump. Right. And there's a lot of ways I think Jeff is doing a great job. But at some point, people at the ballot box have to do their role, play their role as well. Right. right. So I, I think Jack Smith is charging uh, a a slim and there's a, there's a thing prosecutors used to say, like, like slim to win. Right. Which sometimes when you charge a sprawling case, that can be more difficult to prosecute. And you're seeing it, for example, in Georgia. Right. I, I don't think Bonnie Willis was wrong to charge the case she charged. I think she was ambitious and she should have been. But when you have that many defendants, right, her current issues about whether or not she should be disqualified, that's being brought by Mike Roman, which I, I guarantee most people in your room don't even know who Mike Roman is. Like that, that wasn't brought by Donald Trump. That's brought by one of the many defendants that are there. Right. You think about how long that case will take to try. Mm -hmm. I think we have 16 defendants left in um, in Bonnie Wilson's case. She's talking about that case being tried some point into 2025. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So like when you have sprawling large cases, that's really hard to charge, uh, really hard to prosecute. And frankly, it takes the onus off the person that this is all really about, which is Donald Trump. That's what this is about. Yes, he led a conspiracy, but the same way my old office charged El Chapo, the drug kingpin. Right. And Chapo went to trial by himself. He had a massive, massive drug empire. But if you put Chapo on the stand and Chapo's next to the guy four levels down, that to some degree can make Chapo look less culpable than standing there by himself. And I think the same logic can apply to the former president. Well, and so that, that brings up, and especially when you talk about 2025, it brings up you know, a really interesting point. Part of what the former president has basically tried to claim is that he is above the law uh, because of his, his status as being a former president. Um, and, and I think you know, you know, it makes me sort of wonder how much even things like Gerald Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon has sort of ingrained in our national consciousness of like, no, the, like the cost of potentially doing this is too high. Um, what happens, say he wins in this election, say the Supreme Court says, no, you can be on the, ba on the, on the ballot, and it's a conservative Supreme Court, and he wins, what happens? Do we have a sitting president standing trial you know, after he's inaugurated? What do you think happens? I think practically, if he wins as an inaugurated, the criminal cases are done. Um, because on the federal level, you know, I don't think there's support that a president can pardon himself. But frankly, if you have a Department of Justice that is list that is responsive to him as, a, as the executive, those cases are going to go away if they have not already reached some kind of resolution. Uh, I think, and technically, he, you know, the state is a different sovereign uh uh, 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 sovereign prosecution team, but practically, do I think a state uh, county prosecutor is going to try a sitting president? No. no. 
Um, so I think that's also done. So I, I do think it's true that if he wins and there are no convictions, all this is over. And the other last reason why I think it's all over is because all of this works because we all subject ourselves to the authority of the state as everyday people. That's why all of this, as we call civil society, works. We all agree that these are the rules and we all, when things are done, we agree who's in power and we agree that when a cop pulls you over, that that means something, that you go to the side. And, and if you have a president who has the power to reject authority, if he doesn't follow these rules, I don't know what we do. Right. Because the idea that if he is a, is a president who says, I'm not coming, do we send marshals from who technically are under his authority to right. the executive power to go to the White House to have a gunfight with the Secret Service to say you're coming to court? Right. It just does not work. It would not work. And it most especially would not work with the president who has no regard for institutions. So I think there is an importance to, if possible, getting these cases tried before the election. But frankly, it's most important to keep them out of the White House. Right. So. Um, yeah, so amen on the last point. Um, and. You know, I was one of the people who threw out Trump's, oh God, I almost said first term, throughout Trump's term as president, um, really maintained that the Constitution held pretty well. When you look at what he tried to do um, and the way a lot of things were shut down, um, that I actually thought that it really showed the resiliency of the republic of, of where we were by the end of those four years. Um, my concern now is, first of all, you know, even the, the, the political process that you were involved in with the select committee, um, you know, justice has always been subservient to politics in some ways, in, in the small parts of daily life and writ large. Um, the politics here seems so insurmountable. There's a, a, a writer, Yuval Levin, who said there's, there's always been a George Wallace constituency in American politics except it used to be spread between both parties and now it's all in one party and it's controlling it. And that, con and, and that party is, is just basically blocking everything. I, I wonder, and again, this is just asking for informed speculation on your part. Um, we have a different Supreme Court right now than we had in Trump's term. Uh, how resilient you know, will the Constitution be able to be in a potential second Trump term, uh, you know, or are we looking at a whole different landscape here because of the makeup of the Supreme Court? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, I, I might change the premise just a little bit right. in that things held strong, but I think we were lucky to get out of this the way we did. I don't think we got out of this because our institutions were built so securely and that's why it didn't happen. I mean, you had the 61 of 62 cases that he lost, right? And the one case he won was of no, wasn't dispositive in any way. So yes, the courts did their job there, but he had a multi-pronged plan to overturn the election. And at each level, different individuals stood up and did the right thing, and that's important. But we came, I think, so close to the end in so many ways that it's not, in fact, in my view, truly by design, but by fortune that we didn't have something else. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, Ashley Babbitt was shot and killed at the Capitol. And, you know, we took a tour of the Capitol to kind of see where everything happened. And you go and you stand where she was shot and you see how close things were. But when Ashley Babbitt was shot, the one, as she, the glass she had broken and was trying to hop into was mere feet away from the chamber, which if they had got in there, the members were all kind of there basically unguarded. Right. You would have had a mob who would have had full access to the members of Congress and, in my view, would have killed them. So that was all stopped. But that was really one person who decided to pull a trigger and, and ended up killing her. And I, I, you know, but that was one person's decision. But if you watch the video, there's a world in which that person doesn't do anything or do decides I don't want to be the first one to pull a trigger that day. And you have the members who are all basically slaughtered. You have Vice President Pence, who when his team is trying to get him to a secure location, they think they're preparing for a gunfight. You could we, you know, in our hearing, we have the recordings where we talked about their telling their members of their family. It's kind of like, like you know, it's like telling the, telling their colleagues, like this may be goodbye, but like we're going because they don't know what's out there. 
as they're going to the secure panel, where he ends up going to a secure location to keep him safe, right? And so that's that close. So there's a lot of ways where all these things, for example, my old boss, who was my former U.S. attorney when I was a prosecutor, Richard Donahue, when Trump tells him, you just say that you found fraud as a DOJ, and Trump tells him, you know, me and the Republicans will take care of the rest. Just give us like a, a basically a press release. So Rich Donahue says, no, we'll resign. But in all these things, it's not that there were these vibrant institutions that could not be broken in all these different ways. Frankly, it's just individuals who could have gone the other way saying no. And I what I can what I think is important is Trump lost a lot of critical states. Right. This election and overall, Biden won by seven million votes. So on the aggregate, it wasn't a close election. And even on swing states, Biden won all these swing states that mattered. But if you have a world where Trump only has to convince one state to flip, if you had a world where it was only two states, and this is my personal view, but I think it's a lot harder to ask even the most diehard Republican, whether it's the Secretary of State in Georgia, to be the first guy to do something illegal, when even if he does it, there are six more states that he still loses the election, that becomes more difficult. I think what makes me more concerned is that if you have an even closer election and the people who have to stay strong are a far smaller group Mm -hmm. and the pressure is now far greater, the so-called institutions that hold up, I don't know if they do hold up. And so I, I do think in some ways we are in a weaker place than we were. In some ways we're stronger because we are aware of the threat, we're talking of the threat, we're active and we are defending the nation against the threat. But I do think it's important for people to realize both leading up to the attack and on the day of attack, there were so many ways where it could have broken the other way and it would have been incredibly different. And I think that's what Trump wanted to happen. He wanted the DOJ to fall. He wanted state legislators to fall. He wanted the courts with judges that he appointed to rule for him. And on the day of, while folks are being attacked, while Mike Pence is being told, Trump is being told they want to hang Mike Pence, Trump is okay with it. And he's not trying to stop it. He expresses basically, uh, uh, he expresses agreement with it. And while it's all happening, they're still making phone calls to try to stop the certification while they know the Capitol is on attack, is an attack after he sent these people to the Capitol. So I, I would be cautiously optimistic that these institutions will hold up again, but I would not uh, want to test them again. Well, and so that, first of all, it's a clarion call for everyone to vote. Um, and, and that's everywhere. Uh, the other thing is, and, and I've, I've heard William Barber and many others speak of this passionately, um, we need to recapture, it feels like, a sense of moral courage in our society um, because you know, bullies thrive when moral courage goes into hiding. And, and there are people who, like, and you named uh, you know, one in a very critical role on, on January 6th, who had the moral courage to literally stand between uh, the mob and and members of Congress? Um, you know what what I wonder is when and, and hopefully that stand will happen at the ballot box. Um, but you know where is the locus of that stand now? I know personally for me, I have very little faith in the judicial branch right now, uh, particularly like the the cases that are in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, to exhibit what I would call moral courage. And moral courage isn't just agreeing with me. Um, But to me, this seems to be a fairly clear-cut case. Um, Do you think, you know, as someone who's made the law your life, um, we are at a point where we can no longer rely on the system so much and we really need to to sort of look inside ourselves for the moral courage uh, to resist something far worse happening again? Yeah, I mean, since 2016, and this is, you know, getting out of my professional expertise, I'm just commenting on politics, but Trump has lost in front of the American people again and again and again, right? The the, the 2018 midterms lost in 2022, uh, the 2020 election, obviously, against, against uh, Joe Biden, special elections again and again, Democrats have proved to be successful. So I do think when I look at the American people, that does give me comfort in that it, the American people have not accepted overall Donald Trump. It, now, I think it's too close to for comfort. Right. 
right. but again and again, he's not had the success. The American people, in the aggregate, I think, have shown that kind of moral courage, have rejected this way of being. As far as the court and our institutions and whether they will have um, moral courage, you know, I I still feel. I still feel optimism about the courts and whatnot. The Supreme Court, I think, is effectively a political institution at this point. Yep. So I put that to the side. But when I look at even the Eugene Carroll uh, suit in Georgia and th those th that jury, you have you know eighty something million dollars he has to pay. You have Tish James in New York, who when she brought that case against him, a lot of people in the legal community said that. It was a waste of time. She didn't know what she was doing. But and now you have a four hundred and fifty million dollar judgment against him that he cannot bring up the cash right now without he's trying to find money to go borrow. And every day it's one hundred eleven thousand dollars of interest. Right. You have the we call it the hush money case, but it's really an election interference case that's coming to trial uh, in March 25th of this month. And so I, I do. And these cases, even though I, I think they're still not moving fast enough. But generally, for everyday Americans, the justice system is frustratingly slow, the criminal process. Um, so I, I, I do think that we can have, that there we are seeing lots of good public servants doing their job. Jack Smith's team and right. at, at great personal exposure to themselves and their mm -hmm. family are doing the work. They are fighting day in and day out. Judge Cannon of Florida is doing whatever she can to obstruct the case, in my view. But again, those teams are fighting and pushing hard for the documents case in Florida. So I think all of those give me comfort. And I think, frankly, and this is something we talked a lot about on the committee, and that there was often a difference in perspective in some of the lawyers as to how to look at the state of America. And I think, frankly, I think a lot of the, it was an incredibly diverse committee. I mean, in all kinds of ways, racially, gender, everything. But one thing that I think is an interesting uh, takeaway is that at times I found the lawyers of color, one of the things that you often heard said by us was people were so shocked at the state of America because they had romanticized the America they had previously. And the idea of an America on the brink, and I, and I think what it is that we are all feeling it as Americans, but, you know, one, I, people who kind of look back who, you know, I wasn't around, but people talk about what the 60s and 50s felt like. People talk about you. Because, so like, it's not the first time that the country, for a lot of people, felt like a very precarious place. It felt like a place that was almost itching to break in a way. I'm not trying to diminish what we're facing now, oh, but yeah. I do think it oh, is yeah. existential. But I think especially the lawyers of color were kind of talking like this idea that the next election is everything's on the line. For some of my colleagues, it was the first time they said they ever felt that way. Mm -hmm. And other colleagues were like, oh, it, it's felt that way every election for yep. me. It's felt every election, I felt like this this was the one that could break my family or save my family. And it's always felt that way. So I think there's a way in that the pain of America has almost been like democratized the way that, that a lot of people are feeling that uncertainty and not, it's not good, but I think it is healthy in that it is a shared experience and hopefully it'll be a shared solution. Well, yeah, and that's something that we talk about here at All Saints, which is, you know, vote for the most vulnerable. And maybe you are one of the most vulnerable, but either way, we, you know, we need to all vote in a way that we are all in this, in this together. Um, I've got one more, and then I want to open it up to, uh, to, to the audience here. You've sort of talked a little bit about sort of if Trump wins, this is sort of all this is sort of all over. You know, one of the, like, there's many purposes to having a rule of law. One of them is to serve as a deterrent against bad behavior. Um, if President Biden wins a second term, um, has there been enough of a deterrent with what has happened to those who engaged in what I hope is not the first, it was, definitely wasn't the first insurrection, in the January 6th insurrection? Um, or are we looking at something like that again? Or are we looking at something, you know, maybe even worse? I mean, that's, again, that's speculation, but I'm sort of interested from yeah. your from your vantage point. Well, I think I would look at that probably in, in a couple of different ways. I okay. think if you're talking about the ground soldiers, right? If, you, if, there, if this was a criminal enterprise, right. the ground soldiers, I mean, the DOJ, this really has been like the largest DOJ investigation and prosecution in history. You've had 
hundreds and hundreds, I think we're almost up to a thousand folks now who have been arrested and charged in regard to the actual attack on the Capitol. So I think for those specific individuals, as we call it in the law, specific deterrence, those individuals, a lot of people have been held to account about being at the Capitol and attacking police officers and all that. So I think for those individuals, I think there is a deterrence there. But then we have in the law what we call uh, general deterrence, which is basically for everyone else. Does everyone else looking at this now say that I now know that this is a thing that I could get in trouble for because I saw someone else get in trouble for it? Um, but I think my concern about the deterrence here is not about another January 6th, because I, I don't think that's what it would it would likely look like. And that I think practically we saw what January 6th looked like or the Capitol looked like uh, once Joe Biden came into office. I mean, right, for those who are in D.C., the Capitol was basically like barricaded. I mean, they put up fences around for inauguration. Like, they, people were ready at that point. So I think there's a way in which uh, we're often always prepared to fight the last fight that we already seen. Right. And I think what we have to do in this country is to have an imagination, which I think we often lack in the U.S., an imagination of what can go wrong and be thinking about what does the next January 6th look like? Because it's not going to be another attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Right. It's going to be something else. And that's the work that has to be done to think about what does that look like? Is it Are we scared about lone attacks, the lone wolves, right? That's a different kind of version than a, a big mass attack. So I think that's what I would hope that law enforcement currently is focused on and thinking about is, is that new iteration of what people might do. Great. Thank you. Um, we're going to we can stay on in this group until about 10 o'clock. We'll say goodbye to the, the online people in a minute. I just want to turn it over. I want to give you the honor. Do you have a, a first question or anything, either one of you? Uh, OK. OK, I'll, I'll sort of open it up back here. I'm going to go back here to and sort of work my way back. I'll be right back to you, John. Uh, and just say your name, too. Hi, Crystal Jones. Can you guys hear me? Is this? A Crystal Jones, thank you so much for being here um, and for how you ever got here. And I just um, hope that you run for office somewhere, somehow, <laughs> and we will all vote for you and start uh, you off with some fundraising. So <laughs> that's all. No question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very fearful about the future. Um, the fact that Trump has so much influence on what's going on is, is my voice okay? No. Yeah, okay. I, yeah. um, we're all really worried about what's going to happen. But my feeling is absolutely those trials have to take place because we've got, there's so many people who don't believe that Trump has done anything wrong. And I think the closer that we get to the election, it, there's potential for tremendous violence. And Russia is going to work as hard as they can to make sure that there's confusion in the election, that Trump gets elected. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think we've got to do more. I mean, I've been fantasizing about postponing the election until the trials take place. And I don't know what kind of authority the um, Justice Department has if they, if they don't have the power the Supreme Court does. But... There's so many different angles on this, but we've all suffered in all of this, and I want it to stop. Well, we just have to save our country. What, what is your, this is a better microphone, what is your sort of mix of hope and fear at this moment? You know, I, I feel all the above. I think you have to have hope, because if you don't, then we're all done. And I think if you observe reality, you should have a good amount of fear as well. You know, I think as far as the, the elections, ha the, the trials happen before the election, you know, what will be will be. And we only have the, the DOJ, the mistakes that were made at the DOJ, in my view, were made by Attorney General Garland early on by not starting the Jack Smith special investigation right when he got into office. Right. Jack Smith, though, has moved at a very quick pace for an investigation like this. Criminal investigations take a long time, and this is one of unmatched importance. So Jack Smith has done, I think, has moved as quickly as possible. As far as these trials happening before the election, either way, the election is going to be what matters. And I, I and by that, I mean, I, I agree that the American people seeing Trump in court, like the criminal he is, 
sitting there day in and day out, even the optics of that, I think will crystallize what he did more in people's minds, and that's important. Um, but if he were convicted before the election, he's going to have appeals. He, it's all, there's no way he's going to be incarcerated before the election, so it's still going to matter what happens on election day, no matter what. There is no world that, oh, he gets convicted, and then, oh, now Joe Biden is automatically the president again. No, the American people are still going to have to decide who the next president is. And as far as the timing, you know, it, it's, it's, if I were a betting man, we probably don't have any of the federal trial before the election, but it's not done yet. I mean, what Judge Chutkin, who the judge in D.C. in the January 6th federal case has said, is that when they send it back to her, she's ready to go. And this, she's going to set the clock back on. There are 88 days that she has left to give them to prepare. And she said that the political calendar is not going to impact her calendar. The Department of Justice has said the political calendar is not going to impact them going forward in any of their cases. So from, from that perspective, if the Supreme Court sends it back to her and allows the case to continue, the day comes back, she says her clock starts. So I don't think we're done yet. And, you know, my optimistic side says there's a there's a universe that the Supreme Court, presuming they, they say he doesn't have immunity, which is the one point, and two, they don't send it back down for further fact-finding before they want to decide something else. Assuming they send it back cleanly to her, there's a world where he's going to trial right leading up to the election, that he's in trial perhaps in, 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 in October or September, October. And I think that is, and I'm not a political you know, commentator, but the opposite of that, I think, will be at their strongest, that when Joe Biden is on the campaign trail, Trump is in a D.C. court answering to the crimes and having witnesses day in and day out explaining what he did. But again, with all that said, the election is where this will ultimately be decided for long term accountability because a conviction does not stop him. It, I think it changes the American view, the American public's perception. But nonetheless, he's going to be a man walking around on Election Day and people at the ballot have to make the right choice. Yeah, thank you. We're going to go ahead and say goodbye to the people online. Uh, but we can continue in here for uh, 10 minutes or so. I've got another couple questions around. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Catherine, and to your point about the Supreme Court, obviously they shouldn't be swayed, but as a people, can we write to them? Can we call our local news stations and ask them? I mean, can we have an impact in any way, in a good way? Um, frankly, on the Supreme Court, no. Uh, the, in that the, the Supreme Court is not going to be swayed by, I think, kind of targeted public outreach. I just don't think it'll happen. I think, one, the biggest way folks can be helpful is to call everyone you know in a swing state and get people registered to vote, get people voting. I think that is, in my view, again, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so it's a little outside of my wheelhouse, but I think that's the most important thing that people could do. And to the extent that folks are in swing states, I think folks should be thinking about, okay, who is my secretary of state? Who in my state is going to be the one who decides whether or not to reject ballots, right? Because that's the next potential fight in the election. If you're in a swing state and a secretary of state, and frankly, I would say this, in the midterms, one of the things that we were really happy to see and proud is that so many, I think basically every Trump kind of secretary of state individual got rejected by the voters. And that was one of the things that the Trump side tried to do post January 6th is, OK, for the next time, let's get all these Trump people in the role to be able to reject ballots and do all that. And they failed. Right. They didn't get those people into offices. But that's the big threat in the next election. It's not the January 6th attack. It is a secretary of state saying, you know what, all these votes, there were irregularities in Detroit. You know, you can imagine why Detroit and those votes should be thrown out because of X, Y, Z reason. And all of a sudden, that's the issue where now does Joe Biden lose Michigan because they're not counting black votes in Detroit? So I think that but the, those people are accountable to the people. So it's thinking about who represents different states in those roles that matter for the election, for the security uh, of the election that really matters. Right. You look at the secretary of state in Georgia that Trump called and said filed 11,000 votes. He stood up to Trump, but that was an elected official. That's someone that the people voted 
into that role that did the right thing. So I think that's why I would focus my attention is both on the political voting, but looking in wherever um, I live or those that I love live and thinking about, okay, what officials in those states can help with election security? So I, I loved your answer about not being able to lobby the Supreme Court. I would sort of give one caveat. If you happen to own an island and you have a plane that could get Clarence Thomas and his wife there, you might be able to move the needle on that a little bit. But other than that, you're right. I don't think you can do that. Yeah, and he's been offered by a television host a million dollars and uh, a new yacht, <laughs> John Oliver, yeah. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, I was alive during the 50s and remember the McCarthy era and what that was like. And coming off of World War II, the government, in the war, we suppressed a lot of civilian rights, and that happens in every war. And coming off the war, some of our agencies continue to do that. And it took the church committee many years later to start shutting down some of these illegal activities. But that wasn't for a long time. But it seems like there's a kind of people go to excess and then it gets resolved. I'm just not sure I see a resolution this time. And that's uh, my question to you is, you seem hopeful and I'm glad you are, but in this cycle where one part of government gets extreme and then people put it down, in the past there's always been the assumption that you're American, even if you're a Republican or a Democrat or independent, American first, but I don't see that anymore in, in some of the followers. And I'm wondering what your take is on that. Yeah, I, I do think America is in an existential, I think it's an existential threat. So I think I'm hopeful in the sense that we have no choice but to keep fighting because the, the, the what's on the other side is so terrible and such a nightmare that to say there's no hope is, is that, that that's equally as scary. But I, I don't want my idea of hope to be to suggest that I do not think that there will be massive harm. I, I think, frankly, this harm that Trump uh, would have, or you know, brings is still understated. And I think when you look at what him and his allies are saying they're going to do, and there's an old Maya Angelou uh, uh, quote where, you know, when people tell you who they are, uh, show you who they are, believe them the first time. And I think that, I, so I, I fully agree that the damage done to America would be, would be unparalleled. And I think that that should only motivate us more so, you know, and this is, again, me kind of leaning over outside of my expertise at the politics. But, you know, when I when I think about the election, I do think the framing of Biden or bust is is right. You know, that that and I do get frustrated when I hear people um, kind of express grievances and then say, oh, but we all don't want Trump. And it's like, well, you, and what's on the line and what Trump has promised? I mean, you have. Uh, Stephen Miller, his close advisor, has said that they're going to set up the largest scale, basically, in, uh, uh, camps that we've seen in American history. They've talked about how they're going to nationalize the Guard and arrest immigrants across the country and put them in camps. Uh, they, they, they're they saying this openly, right? These, these, these plans are online now. You can Google them about the Heritage Foundation has the plan they have out for 2025. So all these plans that are creating this fascist world that, that they want, they're not hiding it. And I think that's that's what even makes me more concerned is that you, if you're willing to say this out loud, what are the parts you're not willing to say out loud? Uh, so I, I am hopeful and and I and I, I I'm only hopeful because we have to be, because and a lot of people are doing a lot of hard work. From our work on the committee to prosecutors to local poll workers to folks who are now registering people to vote. There are a lot of people who are in the game, who are fighting, who are doing what they can, even if it's small. You know, there are folks who are, even if they're only giving $10 a month, they're going to the Biden campaign and they do a reoccurring 10 bucks a month because that's how campaign plans are spending out for the rest of the year is to understand what the budgets are going to be. So I think for everyone, there's, for a lot of us, there's only so little, we, it's only so much we can do, to be frank, right? And including me. Uh, I did my committee work, but now I, I'm a part of a law firm. There's not, I'm not, you know, I can go on TV and talk about stuff, but I, you know, I'm limited. We all are. But I think my question is in your sphere of influence, whether it's calling the one person who you know who's more conservative 
and engaging with them in a long-term conversation as to why you can both be conservative. Liz Cheney is as conservative as they, as they come, but she was critical to our success on the committee. And I don't think I agree with Liz Cheney on a single thing, except that America should remain a democracy. Uh, so I think that is an example of, of her work in the committee and her working so closely with Nancy Pelosi that people of completely different political leanings can come together on this issue. So we got time for one more, Sandy. Yeah, we focus a lot on kind of the cult of, of Donald Trump, but the reality for me is that he's only the tip of the iceberg. We have so many, we, we in Los Angeles live in a relatively isolated conclave of, of relatively liberal people. And we have a lot of protections here as we do in a lot of the major urban areas of California. You go out to the rural areas of California, you go into the southern states, particularly Florida, and we have whole groups of people in the southern states, in the middle, in the middle of America that are very adamantly opposed to liberal values and we're becoming increasingly polarized. Now, you're an attorney and you don't want to comment on political issues, and I understand that. But stepping out from your role as an attorney, but knowing the entire legal apparatus of the United States, if for whatever reason Trump is no longer the tip of the iceberg, but some other staunch conservative moves into that role because someone got to Trump one way or another, how do we control this, this increasingly dangerous conservative movement? And I think to what I read yesterday about Pope uh, Francis saying that gender ideology is one of the worst things that he's ever heard of. And back in September, he was saying we should welcome LGBT people into the church. And this morning, I see conservative chat groups talking about increased violence towards specifically gender non-conforming people, trans, non-binary people. What can we do, not necessarily as individual citizens, but through systems of organizations and through the DOJ to try to protect the more vulnerable members of our society? Yeah, I mean, I think any protections we have here have to be seen as a really long-term effort. And for example, I think about Brown versus Board, right? That's 1955. But the legal framework and planning by Thurgood Marshall, others, and NLACP, they start that in the 1920s, right? So it takes decades of work and strategy and planning to get to Board versus uh, to, to, to the Board, uh, to the Brown case. And frankly, you don't have really integration in a lot of places until the 70s. So I do think we have to have a really long horizon. And the way I think about it is you have your short your short term kind of emergency stop gaps. You have the ways where you think, OK, how do I stop the bleeding right now? But when you're thinking about the long term health of the country and long term protections, it has to be really there are lots of organizations all over the country that are working on long term strategic plans. So I think you need you need both to be looking about the short term and the long term. But as far as this kind of right wing hate centered um, world, I don't know. Frankly, I, I just don't know the answer there. And But w what I will say is, and this is maybe a little bit of an odd example, but we had the Dominion voting uh, case and all that, all that, you know, and you had that $700 million, whatever judgment against a uh, settlement from Fox. And you had OAN and other folks that were civilly held liable. Now, what's fascinating now is that even on those right wing stations like Newsmax and OAN, You'll catch them telling you when the, some crackpot comes on, all of a sudden they now say, we, Newsmax has not agreed that the election was stolen, blah, 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 right? Because the lawyer that told them, you're going to get us in, in civil trouble. You go to Fox News now, and it, it, it doesn't get a lot of press, but you have even Fox News pulling that legal card and saying, we do not think the election was stolen. Now, it's a little late. The damage has been done. The minds have been infected. But there are ways in which, through legal processes, you can rein people in, right? I have not heard Donald Trump defame Eugene Carroll again since he had that 80-something million dollar judgment. The $5 million didn't do much for him. 80-something million, all of a sudden, she's not that important to talk about anymore. So I, I do think that we are in the middle of the storm right now, and it feels like 
nothing is going right and the the kind of the other side keeps growing and growing um but again i just point to the political wins right you've had multiple elections and since the 2016 election we cannot point to political successes of the trump movement right you can't say it, it, again and again you see that the other coalition of the opposition has overperformed uh, uh, expectations again and again and again. Uh, so does that mean we're gonna win this election? I don't know, I think we have to go do the work, but I think as far as protections, it's both fighting the immediate and keeping an eye on a long-term goal. Well, and I think part of the work for us is we gotta go get prayed up right now, so we gotta get into church. Um, thank you so much, Tim. Can we just give him a round of applause? Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll probably have you back, ask you back for a continue the conversation. Just God bless you and thank you from a grateful nation for the work that you have done. Amen. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye, everyone. See you.